our next speaker is uh, Nathan Innan, who is a uh, graduate student under uh, Raymond Chow. And so I knew Nathan before um, he knew me because I was following Ray's work. And I noticed that uh, Nathan was on a lot of the papers and I thought, wow, I really should find out uh, more about Nathan and where did he go after uh, working with Ray? And he's uh, been uh, teaching at uh, University of California, Fresno, and also at um, Clovis um, and uh, teaching physics and, and, and such and continuing his work on uh, gravitational effects and the intersection between gravity and superconductors and uh, material and et cetera. And, uh, and then lo and behold, it turns out that Lance was working with Nathan on his DARPA project. And uh, then we also got Nathan involved in our DARPA Quest program, uh, where he was exploring some of these intersections between um, gravity and uh, potential temperature and vacuum effects. And uh, I think he might mention some of the gravitational induction work uh, that he's recently done as well. Anyway, um, thank you for joining us, Nathan, if you'd like to share your slides. I would love to. Thank you so much for the introduction, Charles. I appreciate that immensely. And thank you everybody so much for uh, allowing me to participate in this uh, conference. I'm actually very excited to be able to share just a little bit of uh, what I've been working on. Um, are my slides uh, appearing okay? Yes. Great. Uh, so as Charles said, um, I am affiliated with uh, a number of colleges and universities. Uh, I didn't know which to choose, so I put them all. Uh, so I'm full-time at Clovis College, uh, tenured over there, love teaching. Um, I'm involved, I'm part-time at Fresno State, teaching there as well. Still involved at UC Merced with Ray, uh, who's here at this meeting, who will be giving a talk as well. In fact, our content is very much connected. And so I probably will mention here and there where Ray will be sort of uh, working off the same type of formalism uh, and going in a different direction from what I'm going to talk about here in this talk. Uh, so as probably is the case with uh, most of us who have uh, given a talk here, there's so much more that can be said than what time allows. So of course, I'm going to do my very best to give a sampling of some highlights from the most recent stuff. Uh, I've limited myself at least to just the work I've been doing over the course of this year. Uh, but even there, there's just too much um, to be able to cover everything. So I'm going to focus primarily on this idea of superconductor Meissner effects for gravito electromagnetic fields. But as kind of a uh, backdrop to that, I would like to lay out a little bit of the mathematical framework uh, for electromagnetism and so-called gravito electromagnetism, which many of us are probably already familiar with. But I'd like to just lay it out, take a little bit of time with that, just to make sure we see mathematically the grounding that all this is set on. Uh, so gravito electromagnetism being abbreviated GEM or GEM, uh, particularly in this context, I'm going to be using harmonic gauge or harmonic coordinates and looking particularly at non-relativistic gravitational sources. So I'm not going to be focused on gravitational waves, which is kind of my, uh, usually my focus under Ray. Um, that was what my uh, thesis was on. I'm going to be taking a step back and looking uh, at sources that would not have gravitational waves. Ray will be focusing on gravitational waves. So it makes it kind of nice. You get a sampling of both. Uh, I'm going to start off talking about classical coupling of electromagnetism and gravito electromagnetism. Uh, talk about a few new Faraday-like flux rules that we developed, uh, as well as some methods of extracting energy momentum from gravity. And that's based on some of the work that uh, that first Roman numeral um, is based on work that I'm doing with Charles that uh, we are um, pursuing some uh, hopeful future funding to continue developing. The second Roman numeral is based on uh, some of the work I did with Lance. Uh, we got a little bit more into cosmology, but still there were some very nice developments there that can be carried over into this context as well, which I'll talk about. And then I'll transition to talking about quantum coupling of electromagnetism and gravito electromagnetism. Uh, so I'll mention a little bit about the search for the right Hamiltonian, uh, a new coupling rule in superconductors, and a gravitomagnetic Meissner effect that has already been predicted in the past. But I'd like to uh, demonstrate, as I already mentioned in a comment during Martin's talk uh, at the end, 
that uh, my findings are that the presence of a magnetic field is critical for the gravitomagnetic field to also be expelled from the superconductor in a uh, novel Meissner-like effect. That's probably as much as I'm going to be able to talk about, but I have some bonus topics in case I, I jam through that and no one has questions, and, which is extremely unlikely, but um, if it were to happen, um, I'd love to talk about coordinate invariant gravitoelectromagnetism, which is sort of an extension of the topic that goes beyond the use of harmonic coordinates and is particularly well suited for talking about the expulsion and reflection of gravitational waves from a superconductor. Uh, we could also even talk about gravitational Casimir effect, parametric amplification of gravitational waves. So in other words, instead of a laser, you'd have a gazer. Uh, so we get kind of more and more speculative as we go down this list, but I guess we're allowed to do that in this conference. In fact, we're encouraged to do that, so I felt comfortable with that. Uh, and then lastly, uh, again, a bonus, bonus topic that it's almost certain I won't get to, but maybe if anyone's interested in knowing more about it later, you can ask me, um, which is induced forces and torques due to thermal fluctuations in curved space-time. And this was specifically some stuff I started uh, when working with Charles in the Quest uh, project. Uh, looking at uh, the Newtonian gravitational field, the Lenz-Eterian, or in other words, gravitomagnetic field, gravitational waves, Hubble expansion, how all of those types of gravitational fields could potentially, even in a lab setting, be uh, involved in the induction of forces and torques. Uh, and kind of as an extension to that, this idea of a modified number density distribution due to the uh, temperature transformation uh, when you have relativistic motion or curved space time. So there's a lot on the table. It's like a buffet. And as you know, at a buffet, usually you only get to kind of really eat your favorites before you're full. It's going to be kind of like that. Uh, so let me kick it off by just uh, laying down a little bit of the usual background. Uh, as we know, flat Minkowski space time, I'm going to use the signature of negative one uh, and then positive ones on the rest of the diagonal. Um, introduce h mu nu as a perturbation to flat space time so that the metric uh, g mu nu can be written as Minkowski plus a perturbation. Uh, and then as an example of what the perturbation does, for instance, if you're looking at gravitational waves, then you can picture your flat space time being perturbed in some dynamic manner, as you see here, where this h i j t t or tau tau in the superscript is reminding us that for gravitational waves, Technically, it's the transverse traceless part of the spatial components of the metric perturbation that uh, lead to gravitational waves, which is going to go a little bit beyond what I'm going to get to talk about in detail in this particular talk with the time that I have. By the way, if anyone wants to interject at any point and ask a question or make a comment, you are more than welcome to. Please do. I don't mind at all. Uh, so let me just mention a little bit of the odds and ends mathematically uh, so you know what the symbols are representing here that I'm using. Uh, X mu is the usual uh, four displacement uh, where mu is running from zero for time and then one, two, three for space. And then this C mu is allowing us to introduce a linear coordinate transformation. So we find that the metric perturbation tensor transforms in the way shown here, which is very analogous to what we find in electromagnetism. So for those of us familiar with the um, electromagnetism in covariant form, we tend to work with the um, vector potential, four potential, and it transforms with this four divergence of this scalar quantity, this chi uh, here at the end. So the point though there is, you see the analogy between the two. We're gonna keep pushing on that analogy and it's very common in the literature to use harmonic coordinates or harmonic gauge. Gauge is a shorter word, so <laughs> use gauge instead of coordinates, but use whatever you feel is more fitting in this context. But the point is that we introduce this trace reversed metric perturbation, this h mu nu bar, and we take the four divergence and set that equal to zero. Again, very analogous to the Lorenz gauge in electromagnetism. So the benefit of all of this is that now we find that the Einstein field equation in this linearized context in harmonic coordinates for the trace reverse metric perturbation turns out to satisfy a wave equation. And it looks just like the wave equation that we get in electromagnetism. So it allows us to use a lot of the same machinery, mathematically speaking, to understand gravity as we do for electromagnetism. 
So carrying on with the analogy, we can define a gravitational scalar potential in terms of the time-time component of the metric perturbation. And we can define a gravito vector potential uh, in terms of the off-diagonal components of the uh, metric perturbation. And that allows us to, again, push this analogy all the more by introducing a gravitational four potential, very analogous to the electromagnetic four potential in the sense that there's a scalar potential and a vector potential that together make up your four potential. And we can also work with an ideal fluid stress tensor. I'm going to be focused on the non-relativistic approximation. So in other words, your time time component is just going to be your rest energy density your time space component is like a momentum density, or you could think of it as like a mass current if you want to kind of, again, speak in terms of what is common in electromagnetism. And then the spatial part of the stress tensor, we're going to approximate to zero because it's second order in velocity. And so for non-relativistic dust, we're forgetting pressure and we're forgetting uh, second order velocity contributions. So that causes us to uh, be able to define what I'm going to call a mass four current, which is basically your mass density in the time component and then your mass three current there. And that allows us to finally arrive at this very, very Maxwell like field equation for gravity. And this is usually the framework that people work in when talking about gravito electromagnetism in harmonic gauge or harmonic coordinates. So just for visual, so you can kind of picture what we're doing as far as the metric perturbation goes, the matrix then is gonna involve basically the scalar potential on the diagonal and the vector potential on the off diagonal there. And so we can go a step further and define the usual gravito electric field and gravito magnetic field in a similar definition as we would in electromagnetism. And uh, Martin already mentioned that this is well established. In fact, he did a marvelous job, well, much better than I would do in, experiment, in uh, explaining experimentally how this gravitomagnetic field has been observed already uh, because it causes this dragging of space time uh, around Earth. And gravity probe B has detected deviations in line of sight towards stars. And, and as I mentioned, Martin described that very well. So I'll just kind of piggyback off of that and not spend too much more time talking about this field. But this gravitomagnetic field is going to be critical to what I'm going to talk about with a Meissner-like effect. So I wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page with uh, recognizing how we've mathematically defined this uh, gravitomagnetic field. So what we have then is this set of field equations that are very Maxwell-like, and you can identify these constants. This uh, epsilon g is really just kind of your Newtonian gravitational constant in disguise. Uh, and then your mu sub g, Martin also mentioned this, is the 4 pi g over c squared, which as he also mentioned is super, super tiny, this 10 to the minus 27, which is what makes it problematic in trying to measure experimentally in any kind of uh, lab context. Uh, let me also mention that we have a what I'll call a gravito Lorentz force. And if we stick to first order and test mass velocity, then uh, really this is just coming out of the geodesic equation of motion, uh, taking the spatial part of that equation of motion. And what you can do then is identify that your gravito electric field comes in, your gravito magnetic field comes in with the usual V cross B type. Uh, form, except there's a factor of four just because of the way the fields have been defined here. You're kind of stuck with this factor of four appearing somewhere. You're either going to get it in the equation of motion or you're going to get it in the field equations. I opted to put it in the equation of motion, but you could do it either way. Now, notice you have a couple extra terms that don't occur in standard electromagnetism. Uh, in particular, I'll point out that this capital H vector is how I sort of hid the tensor uh, nature of that term. That capital H is really actually uh, not truly a vector. It's uh, basically your H, little h, i, j, the spatial components, uh, defined in a particular way so that I could write my equation in vector form. But I promise you it's all mathematically sound. Uh, as long as you use these definitions the way I wrote them down, your tensor stuff is still hiding in there. And that was important to Lance and I, who wrote a paper on uh, Maxwellian mirages in linearized general relativity. Uh, because one of the mirages is to think that you could take all tensor nature out of gravity and get something that's purely vector. You can't. Uh, another mirage is that it seems like you could have these waves of electric and magnetic 
uh, fields that would propagate out as electromagnetic waves would, and you don't. It's another coordinate mirage there. So I just want to be uh, honest and upfront that these are things you have to be careful about when working in this context. Another thing to be mindful of, we didn't emphasize it so much in our paper that Lance and I wrote, but these fields, these gravitoelectric and gravitomagnetic fields are not gauge or coordinate invariant. In other words, the analogy breaks off from electromagnetism, where in electromagnetism, when you develop the electric field and the magnetic field, they are gauge invariant quantities in the context of electromagnetism. Here in the context of gravity, where you have coordinate uh, freedom basically is kind of like our gauge freedom. These fields are not invariant. You can make them go away by going into an appropriate frame. Like for, for example, the gravitoelectric field, which is essentially like the, uh, the field we experience from Earth right now that keeps us in our seats, you can go into a frame of reference where you don't observe that field anymore. Like in other words, like you're an Einstein falling elevator is a frame of reference where you're choosing that C double dot in such a way that it's the negative of this uh, gravitoelectric field so that your prime gravitoelectric field can be set and get to, you can make it zero effectively in that frame of reference. So be mindful of that because this is the, that was the motivation why I extended this work beyond this into coordinate invariant or gauge invariant quantities where we can eliminate those issues and have honest to goodness gravity being measured in the lab. So I just wanted to mention that so that we're aware that these are effectively ad hoc definitions based on analogy with ENM, uh, not coordinate or gauge invariant quantities. All right, so with that said, let's get to the meat of what I wanted to share with us today, which is, uh, first of all, there's these flux rules in electromagnetism that I want to remind us of, or there's actually just one flux rule, the Faraday flux rule. And the idea basically is this. We know that when there is a Lorentz force around some closed path, there is an EMF associated with that. And it's the line integral of the Lorentz force around that closed path. Now, we also know standard textbook electromagnetism, you've got this Faraday flux rule, which is the negative time derivative of your magnetic flux. Now, the neat thing is this, when you apply a product rule, uh, because you have to recognize, of course, the flux consists of a magnetic field dotted with a differential area vector. So when you apply this time derivative, you have a product rule, you have a time derivative acting on the magnetic field, and you have a time derivative acting on the differential uh, spatial vector there. Um, and what that means then is you've got two contributions. Often that first contribution is called a transformer EMF, and that second contribution is called a motional EMF. And if you play with the math a little bit, in that first term, if you use Faraday's law, you can get that time derivative of the magnetic field to become an electric field. No surprise there, because that's just Faraday's law, right? But that second term, it's interesting. It turns out that if you play with the math, you can actually show that that second term, which involves the changing boundary of some uh, loop, let's say, for example, can be rewritten as V cross B, where V is the velocity of that moving boundary. And so what this is telling us is that the Faraday flux rule, which is basically time derivative of magnetic uh, flux, is related to the Lorentz force in the top line there. And so what that's basically saying is this, visually speaking, like in, in a physical experiment, it means that when you change the boundary of some parameter, like, like say you have a ring, you change the size of it, you're going to induce forces in that ring, electromagnetic forces. So let's now talk about what that's going to do gravitationally speaking. So let's play the same game, but in the context of gravity. So start with the geodesic equation of motion. As I already uh, showed in detail, it leads us to this uh, gravito Lorentz force. And what we can do now is identify again a flux rule, where from the uh, field equations, we know that the time derivative of magnetic flux is going to induce a gravito EMF. And what that means then is that we have another, we have a match happening here again where in principle, if you were to have a boundary like a ring or a loop and you were to change its area, it should induce gravitational forces in the perimeter of that ring because of this connection between a gravito flux rule 
and, a, and the gravito EMF involving a gravito force. So it's the same connection mathematically, which means we anticipate in a lab, it should be possible to generate gravitational forces by changing uh, boundaries is what this amounts to. Now, that's all meant to show us the parallel of electromagnetism and gravity. Now let's piece it all together. Let's use the Lorentz force in curved space time so that everything comes into play. And the really cool part about this, uh, in my opinion, is that not only do we have electromagnetic phenomena and gravitational phenomena, so the electromagnetics in blue, the gravitational is in red, but then you have this coupling between electromagnetic and gravitational fields that together introduce new forces that I would argue have not been experimentally observed in the lab at this point. And so that's the green box. And so the whole idea basically is that the reason why gravity is so problematic for us to explore in the lab is because it's so weak. But in the green box, you've got electromagnetic fields coupling into gravitational fields to introduce forces that are going to that could be enhanced because we can introduce very strong electromagnetic fields to enhance these terms that we have in the green box and perhaps uh, identify new forces, maybe pointing in new directions, causing torques and things of that nature that we haven't yet seen before. And so if we want, we can kind of get fancy and say, well, we've got this like grandiose EMF. It's the electromagnetic EMF plus the gravitational EMF plus this coupling between e, uh, electromagnetism and gravitational fields, EMF. So you get these three contributions to your overall EMF now uh, in this case. And so just to kind of get our imagination going about what this might look like, I offer a couple application concepts, like you could have the propulsion of a conducting ring via Earth's magnetic and gravitational fields. So if you imagine like a ring uh, falling toward the Earth, as it falls toward the Earth, there's gonna be a time varying flux of the magnetic field of the Earth and the gravitomagnetic field of the Earth. So those are the two terms at the top there in blue and red. Uh, but then you're also going to have some other gravitational terms in the uh, red box there, the long red box. And as I mentioned, these coupling between electromagnetism and gravity that would, I suspect or expect would be novel. And so we would have this coupling of EMGR forces that could be amplified by introducing strong electromagnetic fields. And it reminds me like in the, in the lab or in my classroom when I do the jumping ring experiment, I mean, any of us who have taught physics classes like in electromagnetism, this is one of those fun ones you do for your students. And so I just picture like having a ring and you flip on a current. And as we know, we can make that ring jump off of this um, uh, ferromagnetic core. And so the ring gets launched. And so what I wonder is, is there a possibility of doing experiments like this jumping ring that could somehow be altered or, or demonstrate new physics that's in the green box that hasn't been taken into account before. Another kind of idea to just kind of get our creative juices going would be this like uh, motor gener uh, electromagnetic slash gravitational motor generator. Again, it's just the same ideas of time varying fluxes generating energy or energy generating you know time varying you know this reciprocal relationship that we know exists between motors and generators except now again we have this coupling between gravity and electromagnetism that might alter or enhance um, these types of motor generator type uh, systems in ways that we haven't seen before all right so that's my sort of discussion of classical stuff now, uh, oh, I will mention a little bit more about some formalities of what Lance and I worked on together. And I, I, uh, I'd like to just mention that this is sort of the broad framework of what we'd like to work on in the future, uh, you know, provided funding comes in and all that. We'd like to look uh, at all the possibilities that might exist in general relativity when we have matter sources, and then all the possibilities that could exist when you have electromagnetic sources and so all that's in the context of gravitational field equations and then lastly take a look at the Maxwell field equations in curved space time and and so the whole motive here is what are all the different couplings that could exist between gravity and electromagnetism that have not yet been explored so this is like a large playground 
this slide is a large playground to look at all the different kinds of possibilities that could exist out there. Um, and so what I was saying was that Lance, uh, I, I uh, thank Lance very much for um, this, uh, this set of slides right here because uh, it was motivated from our looking at cosmology, the FLRW uh, metric, and asking ourselves, is it possible to extract energy momentum from the gravitational field of the universe? And that sort of propelled us, uh, mind the pun, but propelled us into this development of this formalism of recognizing that the gravitational field has a stress tensor associated with it. That's that lowercase t mu nu there. And so conservation of stress energy between a test body and a gravitational field leads us to the possibility that the energy momentum of a test body, that's the green bubble, could in fact be affected by the energy momentum of a gravitational field that the test body is being, say, propelled by. So this gave us sort of a framework for how we could extract energy momentum from a gravitational field and deposit it into a test body. Now, to be honest, unfortunately, what we found as far as cosmology goes is that it always ends up being the opposite, that the test body is always losing momentum to the gravitational field of the universe. And that was a bummer because obviously we were hoping to be able to see the opposite happen. And that's what motivated uh, Lance in particular to take a look at this whole idea of engineering a method that we could use to enhance the energy momentum of a system by the presence of gravity. And so this, this slide gets a little bit more technical than I really want to kind of want to get into, but I just want to lay out the framework to point out that you might notice here that, that uh, what we're starting out here with is conservation of uh, stress energy, the standard, you know, um, a standard principle in general relativity. But what we're doing is introducing an external non-gravitational driving force, this A mu, and also identifying that gravity is going to couple in to the stress energy tensor of our system. That's the green bubble. And so what ends up happening then is this. You have basically the blue bubble is your non-gravitational driving force. The green bubble is the extra force you pick up because of the presence of gravity. And the red bubble is the net result of the extra energy momentum that the system receives because of being driven by an external force in the presence of gravitational field. So that's kind of in a nutshell what this is telling us here. I kind of liken it by analogy to like maybe a spring mass system. You would take a mass and you apply some external force like your hand. That would be like the blue right there. And then the spring is going to supply some additional force. Uh, that would be like the green. And then as a net result, this, the mass that's attached to the spring is going to experience a, a change in its energy momentum because of the combination of your hand and the spring. And so the spring is like gravity here. It's adding an extra uh, effect on the system that wouldn't otherwise be there if we didn't have gravity. And by the way, we're, we're already well aware of a lot of this. Like the slingshot approach, like when we use planetary bodies, the gravitational field of a planetary body to slingshot like a, a um, satellite, for instance, uh, or a space shuttle around the planet, that is encoded in here. It's just that it's, this is a more generalized version of that. And so uh, we can expect then that there can be forces, that's that uh, force equation, and energy, that's this energy equation, that can be picked up from gravitational fields of all sorts. And so uh, generally speaking, all we usually care about in space physics is usually just the Newtonian force, but you can see there's so many other connections coming in here. All three of these connections come in that could induce forces enhanced by gravity. And all three of these connections come in that could introduce additional contributions of energy due to gravity. So there's just a richness here is the main point that this slide is meant to convey. 
So all of that is classical. Now let me use the remaining time that I have to talk quantum a little bit, particularly superconductors. And as I mentioned to Martin, I'm particularly interested lately, or really actually for a number of years, even since I was working on the PhD in DeWitt's paper, which kind of pioneered this topic, which is titled Superconductors and Gravitational Drag. It was back in 1966. And this paper has been referenced uh, very, very extensively. And so it's kind of a starting point for me uh, to study DeWitt's work. And there's DeWitt there. Uh, he's a, quite a tall gentleman there. Uh, looks kind of angry to me. I don't know, but I'm sure he was a great guy. Um, and I don't know if you guys recognize this guy in the middle here. Um, anyone recognize who that is? Just curious. Got to, got to see him live in my lifetime. Thorne, Kip Thorne. That's right. That's Kip Thorne in his uh, younger days, right? He doesn't look like that anymore, obviously, but you know, we all, we all move along in life. And so what's going on basically is that um, DeWitt is collaborating with, you know, these other gentlemen here and so forth. And, and so he wrote this paper where he wrote down this Lagrangian, which is, um, I'm going to give a little more details about where this Lagrangian comes from, but it's pretty well known that this first term is what's associated with the usual coupling of gravity to a test particle. So it's like associated with your geodesic equation of motion. And that second term is what's going to give you your, your Lorentz force. So you've got these relativistic charge scalar particles. I mentioned scalar because the spin isn't coming in here. We're not worried about spin. So this works out great for Cooper pairs because they're pairs of electrons. And so the, uh, the spin ends up being uh, no longer a concern when you've got two electrons um, making up what effectively is almost like a spin zero boson. Now, DeWitt arrives at this Hamiltonian. He actually just goes straight from Lagrangian to Hamiltonian. And as you can see, there's a lot that goes in. And you can see the math gets pretty nasty there. Uh, I'm going to point out that there's some issues with this Hamiltonian. When I went through and did the nitty gritty, I actually found there's some very important issues that affect the physics and affect what happens in the lab. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Now, what he does, what DeWitt does is he goes to a first order in the perturbation, and he also says it's very slow moving particles. And so he reduces his Hamiltonian down to that uh, expression that I have there. And so then he says, oh, look at that. We've got like a coupling rule. He doesn't actually call it, he doesn't write down a minimal coupling rule, but that's effectively what you can see is going on there. Uh, in fact, uh, Ray uh, was kind of, the, I, to my knowledge, the first that started to call this the DeWitt minimal coupling rule. And it, 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 now what DeWitt did say explicitly is that this field, which he called it a G vector, I don't think that was the best name because it's not, uh, it, it's, it's a combination of the magnetic field and the gravitomagnetic field all into one field. So it's not purely gravitational. It's a combination of both. Now what DeWitt says is that entire field should vanish inside the superconductor. And then he goes a step further and it's, uh, goes into some stuff that's beyond what I'll get to be able to talk about today. I, I would really love to, but time constraints. DeWitt predicts that if you take a superconducting ring and place it in the presence of a gravitomagnetic field, you should get an electric current induced out with that order of magnitude, where little m is your Cooper pair mass, big M is the mass of this like giant cylinder that you'd be like spinning in the lab, for example, to, to, to generate the gravitomagnetic field. And V is the velocity of that, the, of the rim of that uh, cylinder. And then of course, divided by the electron charge and then the diameter of that giant mass. And the ring is just like sitting snug pretty much right where the cylinder is. So they're the same diameter. Anyways, the point is that I did actually demonstrate in a paper that that prediction in my understanding is incorrect. Uh, and I'll explain why that is. But let me finish off the job representing DeWitt. And so what DeWitt then says is, look, your usual Meissner effect is predicted by this Hamiltonian because we see that the magnetic field gets expelled from a superconductor. So let's just extend that logic on the basis that the Gravito vector potential also appears in this Hamiltonian now and say that the Gravito magnetic field would also be expelled from the superconductor. Uh, so it was done in one fail swoop in his paper. It's a very short paper, by the way. Um, and so what I have done as of recent, this is a paper I just uh, wrote over the winter break. Um, unfortunately, I got COVID and I was laying in bed for a week or two and I couldn't do anything else. And so I just wrote a paper. <laughs> what better time to have everyone leave you alone and get some research done. So, uh, so I wrote this paper and I just submitted it. It's being peer reviewed. It was going great. And then one of the referees kind of disappeared and, and evidently for personal reasons, I, would, I was informed um, with you. So it's not published yet, 
Uh, although I don't mind if this is recorded, by the way, Charles, I hope it is. Um, so this isn't published yet, but it's in the making and it's being peer reviewed. And one of the reviewers said, great, go forward. Uh, they are looking for another one to finish off the job. Let me just mention a few key points from this that tie into what we're talking about. First of all, what happened was when you approach the topic very carefully and rigorously, you do arrive at a canonical momentum and a new minimal coupling rule for sure, but it's it's more extensive actually than what you'll see in DeWitt's paper. Uh, in fact, it, it also couples in gravitational waves, not just the gravitomagnetic field, and that's what Ray is going to expand on. So I won't take any time on gravitational waves because Ray will, of course, take care of that for us. Uh, but another key result that I wanted to mention, and I mentioned this in my comments to Martin, is that what I find, and I actually notice there's a few other papers out there where it seems like others may have found this also, is that the gravitomagnetic field is expelled from the superconductor only when the magnetic field is also present. If the magnetic field is absent, then you don't get an expulsion of the gravitomagnetic field either. And that comes out of the mathematics. And I can also even kind of argue conceptually perhaps why that's the case. But let me, let me get there with the remaining time that I have. So here's the idea. You usually when we're working with gravity, we like to stay covariant because obviously, you know, relativity is a space and time theory that uni unifies them. So we like to work with a Lagrangian of this form, which is covariant in the sense that these are four velocities and a four potential there. Uh, and we know that if you apply the Euler Lagrange equation to that Lagrangian, you get what you should, which is the Lorentz force in curved space time, which I was already playing with earlier in this um, talk, talking about classical um, ramifications of this equation. So we like this Lagrangian because it gives us the equation of motion we know we should have. Now, the problem with it, though, is that when you go to evaluate a canonical form momentum, which then is this P mu, turns out to be M, uh, times u, the four velocity, and then the, the, it's like a usual minimal coupling rules you can see, it's just covariant, so it looks good. But the problem is that when you go to apply a Legendre transformation to get your Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian vanishes. And that's been identified in a few papers and Birchinger does a lovely job of explaining the real deep understanding of why this happens and he gets into uh, symplectic, uh, uh, it, it's Honestly, it's highbrow mathematical physics that goes beyond what I could probably do justice to. But I will say this, this has been recognized and it's a problem in this context because if you're Hamiltonian zero, then obviously how are you gonna quantize it and talk about quantum systems? So what you gotta do instead is go to a space plus time approach. And it might look like I didn't change much, but I did. Because what's going on here is instead of U, you have V for the velocity. And so what we're doing then is working with the coordinate velocity, where as we all know, the four velocity is gonna involve the, uh, this gamma factor times the coordinate velocity. And the gamma factor's got gravity hiding in it. So gravity is coming in in a different way in that sense because of the fact that the gamma factor has metric per, uh, contributions in there. So just kind of keep that in mind. Now, when you go to evaluate the canonical momentum, well, it's not going to be a four momentum now. It's a three momentum because it's going to be the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the three velocity. And here is probably the most important part of maybe this set of slides. This is the new canonical momentum that you arrive at. And the key here is to note that you've got your gravito magnetic field is basically or gravito vector potential is hiding in these G zero I's. So that's going to be relevant to the DeWitt type work. But then you've got these G sub I J. Those are the spatial metric perturbation components. That's where gravitational waves are going to be. So maybe I'll just highlight and I'll do Ray a favor and just mention, you see here that term right there is where gravitational waves couple to the vector potential. And that's what Ray is going to be focused on. Uh, in fact, let me expand this out just a little bit more and point out that your new minimal coupling rule that you should have would look like this. Basically, you've got your momentum, and your canonical momentum that is, and then you've got your usual minimal coupling rule with minus E times the vector potential there, but you've got all this extra stuff coming in because of the presence of gravity. And what DeWitt identified is this extra piece right there because he brought in the vector potential, the gravito vector potential. And what I'm saying is we've got more stuff going on here that is interesting. Gravitational waves coupling to the velocity, 
gravito vector potential coupling into the scalar, the electric scalar potential, and gravitational waves coupling into the vector potential. And that's the la that last term is the one that Ray is going to be focused on. I'm going to look at a um, as uh, the uh, Hamiltonian that we get just very briefly. This is the Hamiltonian we arrive at. Now, it looks a lot like DeWitt's, except that tilde on the metric perturbation. You see that tilde is actually introducing gravity in a different way. And I, I don't know if it was an oversight in DeWitt's paper or what, who, you know, there's no way to ask him now, uh, but that's gonna affect what happens when you expand the Hamiltonian out to the same order DeWitt did. You get a bunch of other couplings that were not in DeWitt's paper. Uh, again, I highlight gravitational waves would come in here, coupling into the vector potential as well as to the canonical momentum. But our my interest in this particular talk is going to be, again, the gravito vector potential coupling in there to the canonical momentum. And by the way, notice also, this is something I thought is very interesting. DeWitt's Hamiltonian, if you look at it carefully, if you multiply out this uh, trinomial that's squared, you're going to get a multiplication, uh, a coupling between the vector potential and the gravito vector potential, but it doesn't actually happen. Did you see here that that first, that second term in the Hamiltonian does not match DeWitt's? The gravito vector potential does not appear in there. So his Hamiltonian predicts couplings that don't really happen. But anyway, so that's all in my paper. I'm gonna uh, cut to the final chase here since I only have like a, a minute and just mention this, which is that if you look, if you apply this now to Cooper pairs, which are in the zero momentum eigenstate in the bulk of a superconductor, then you can find your supercurrent velocity and then write down I'm going to write them down separately, the charge current and the mass current. So this is obviously the flow of charges and the flow of mass. Remember, it's there's the Cooper pairs carry both charge and mass. So both of those currents exist for the same reason that Cooper pairs are flowing a lot, right? Now, what happens is you find then that the new constitutive equations, the London constitutive equations get modified. And let me just highlight what's going on here real quick, which is that the usual London equation is this guy right there with alpha set to one. And you can see why alpha is one. It's because alpha involves the scale, the gravitational scalar potential. So if you ignore gravity, then alpha is just one. And then this green box is just the usual London constituent equation because this capital lambda is the usual coefficient that you get there involving the number density of Cooper pairs times the charge squared divided by the electron mass. But you also have another constituent equation because you care about the mass current also. And so you've got these parallel constitutive equations. Take those two constitutive equations and now put them into their respective field equations, the Ampere law and the Gravito Ampere law. What you find is that if you have just electromagnetism, for example, on the left, you get the usual London penetration depth. But if you have just gravity on the right, so this would be like a neutral superfluid or the absence of, of the magnetic field, you don't get a penetration depth for the gravito magnetic field. It's not expelled from the superconductor. Now, if you keep both the magnetic field and the gravito magnetic field, the resulting field equations are coupled. You get a field equation involving the Laplacian of the magnetic field, and over here, a field equation involving the Laplacian of the gravito magnetic field. Do a little bit of math to decouple these differential equations. And what you arrive at is this, this is kind of my final statement, is that this K that you have appearing here in the gravito magnetic field field equation can goes negative only when you have a magnetic field present because this term here will dominate that green box will dominate over this blue box in fact you can see why it's because the blue box involves mu sub g which we already established is very very tiny 10 to the minus 27. when k squared goes negative then the gravito magnetic field differential equation here is yukawa like in other words it's got an exponential decay but if the magnetic field's absent 
then k squared is positive, and that field equation is Helmholtz-like, which means no exponential decay. So what I conclude then is this. You get the standard Meissner effect, which is just a magnetic field, gets expelled from a superconductor. Then you have the gravitomagnetic field, and if that's all you have and there's no magnetic field around, there's no expulsion of the gravitomagnetic field. If you have both of them around, then they both get expelled, which is, I think, what DeWitt basically could be justified in having claimed. And lastly, if you have a neutral superfluid, which means it doesn't couple the magnetic fields even if they were around, then you can't get the gravitomagnetic field to be expelled because you have to have the magnetic field there. So uh, in conclusion, I identified new classical forces that are yet to be explored via flux rules and electromagnetic and gravitational coupling. And I also talked about the expulsion of the gravitomagnetic field that's predicted to occur in a Meissner-like effect for superconductors only when a magnetic field is also present. So I think I landed right about where I'm supposed to. Um, as I said, the bonus material was uh, unlikely to uh, be possible for us to talk about, but it's there in case anyone has a question about it, I'd be happy to get into it. But of course, uh, if, if there are any questions about what I actually did present in detail, I, I would love to hear it. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Nathan. The, you know, the, everything at the buffet looks so tasty. I would like to sample it all and maybe relish some of it uh, <laughs> with a second helping. Yeah. <laughs> Invite uh, me back one day, and then I, I would love to if that uh, is an option. Right, right. Um, ha have you... Uh, taking a look at the potential magnitude of the forces that could be obtained via the the uh, your new flux rules, uh, like what, like how big of a field do you need to have an impact on gravity, or how much rotation in the field do you need? Um, do you have any idea about that yet? I have not yet, Charles, and actually, uh, to be honest, and not to sound facetious, but that's what I was hoping we'll get paid for. <laughs> right, right, that's what I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so we laid this out as a grant, groundwork to sort of like tantalize the taste buds, but we we don't, the meal's not cooked, so I don't know if it's going to taste good at the end, honestly. Um, right, right. I can tell you this off the top of my head, though that in that green box, which is what I think you're referring to is the coupling between gravity and electromagnetism, yes. you'll notice that the gravitational scalar potential, for instance, the phi uh, coming in there, we know that phi is like 10 to the minus 10. Uh, Lance has emphasized that time and time again for the case of the earth, that is. Um, and so you get this phi over c squared, which is super tiny. And so then the question I think is what this will come down to then, Charles, is how large of an electric field or magnetic field can we produce to compensate for the smallness of this gravitational field that we have here to make the green box become relevant? Right. So right. to be honest, I don't actually know on an engineering level what are the order of magnitude of fields that we can achieve in the lab to do that. Right. Okay. Yeah, admit, admittedly, it could turn out to be that gravity is just, just too darn small to be able to compensate for it with the electromagnetic fields and get something um, observable in the lab. Yeah. Uh, did you have a chance to listen to Yochiro's talk? I did uh, not, unfortunately. Yes, yeah, so he has started to do some, um, you know, he's been doing some analysis of you know, cooling with a moving body. I think maybe you've uh, seen some of that at the last Quest yep. uh, presentation. And in taking a look at what the Carnot efficiency is of that based on um, his definition of the efficiency near as I can determine, uh, forced him to select the Einstein-Planck uh, definition for, uh, you know, whether a moving body gets hotter or colder, which I think... Uh, I yeah, this whole correct. issue here that we talked about, right? Right, right, yes. right. And I know all their analysis has been done um, covariantly, so that that's not an issue, right? But I think, from what I understood, uh, they had to make a selection when they were looking at the Carnot efficiency. 
I had a feeling that was going to happen, honestly, actually. I didn't get to see his talk, but I heard him say something about this before, and I thought exactly that, which is that at some point, as you can see here on this slide, temperature comes in, and you can't get away with having to identify a transformation for it. Sure, we got away with the covariant formulation that you see appearing here, making it possible to basically, you know, in a nutshell, for the benefit of everybody listening, um, what's going on is when you're looking at a number density distribution and you've got temperature coming in there, um, there's this ongoing debate for literally a hundred years of how does temperature transform? Does it involve the division by gamma or a multiplication by gamma, or does gamma not play a role at all? And so I understand, right, that um, the whole idea was we can avoid that issue by writing down something covariant. And we can do that. Uh, we can write down something covariant um, as, as, I've, as I've done here, but it's still, when you go into the lab, you're still gonna have to make a measurement of temperature at the end of the day. And so there's a question of what to predict. Is it gonna be higher or lower or, or the same when something's moving relativistically? And then furthermore, what happens when you bring gravity in? So if we go to space, curved space time, then things get even more interesting. But yeah, so thank you for bringing this up, Charles. I didn't get to see the talk, but and this was one of my buffet items so you know you right, you've, right. Pl you've plucked it out thank you for for us to talk about but yeah yeah so it might be worth uh emailing yochiro and you know seeing what he says about that uh near as i can understand the selection of the efficiency is somewhat arbitrary and so the fact that they came out with the einstein plank didn't do anything to uh, resolve this hundred year old issue. I had I had a uh -huh. feeling that was going to be the case. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, sure. any, any other questions for Nathan? Yep. I, I have a question to George here. Nathan, uh, early on in your uh, uh, excellent presentation, you talked about an expanding ring uh, or a loop. Can you uh, just remind me of what that uh, uh, the implications of that were and are again? Absolutely. Uh, implications on what? Did well, you say? Uh, what does uh, what does it mean for uh, the coupling if there is one? Ah, um, okay. Yes, I I uh, mentioned that idea in uh, for the purposes of giving us a little bit of sort of a visual of how we could perhaps uh, identify in a in a real system what these time varying fluxes should do. So we know from electromagnetism that if you were to change the size of your ring, you're changing the magnetic flux that you have through that ring. So I thought to myself, well, we also know from linearized GR in this context that there's gonna be a time varying gravitomagnetic flux there also. And since the earth provides a gravitomagnetic field, then you could have a ring uh, either change size or change position in the presence of the gravitomagnetic field. And that's going to generate a time varying gravitomagnetic field. And if what we have here is um, valid, which I'm fairly confident all the math here is just fine, then that time varying gravitomagnetic flux uh, that we have from either changing the perimeter of the ring or changing its location in the field should generate, and I think this is getting to the to answering the question you're asking, it should generate a force around the perimeter of that ring on the mass particles that make up, if you have, say, like um, free particles in there, like if you have a conductor, like a gravitational conductor, basically, so you can have free particles that can uh, traverse the perimeter of the ring, then this formulation would predict that it will generate a current, which I suppose would even become be an electric current if those are charged particles, right? Yeah, that's what I was wondering. If you actually either expanded a superconducting ring or dropped it, would you see a circulating current? That is that is an excellent question. And so now you're actually taking this formulation and combining it with the stuff on superconductors. Um, you know, I sort of separated them in some sense, but you're absolutely right. It, they're directly connected. And that is a great question. We, we want to, and that, by the way, I should mention is what I think DeWitt was thinking of when he made this prediction right here at the bottom of this slide. 
and he said now in his case he wasn't talking about altering the ring uh in its size or repositioning it in his paper what he says is if you take the ring and you place it say uh parallel uh coaxial with a cylinder and you spin up the cylinder it's going to generate a gravitomagnetic field so he wanted to generate the gravitomagnetic field with a cylinder for instance which which might make more more sense because you could achieve very high rotation speed and that might compensate for the small mass compared to earth anyways the point is he arrives at this order of magnitude there at the bottom uh for an electric current that should be generated in the superconducting ring now i didn't have time to get into why i think that that result is actually not correct um yeah okay yeah but, well, the, the, the converse of course is in, in a simplistic way of looking at it let's uh, induce a large current in a superconducting ring does it fly up or down the jumping ring yes that is what i thought would be a very interesting concept is the jumping ring which is exactly what you just said now the force by the gravitomagnetic field is going to be so small that it's not going to be jumping very high. <laughs> I mean, like it'd be more like microscopically perturbed ring, you know, but it would be a perturbation that if you could measure experimentally, you'd have a way of actually measuring gravitomagnetic fields in the lab. Yeah, thank you. Sure. I had a question, Nathan. Yeah. Yeah, um, in slide 14, uh, you have the three terms, the gravitational, electromagnetic, and then the coupling. Yeah. You see the electromagnetic involves the charge, the gravitational involves the mass, yep. but then the coupling only involves the charge. True. Uh, why isn't there a mass there as well? Great question, Lance. It's actually, I can tell you mathematically why that's happening, and then we can think about if there's some physics to talk about, but it's coming out of this term right here. The green box, uh, the green oh. boxes, I guess I could say, plural, are, are, uh, are associated with one another. So do you see there that? Yeah. Is, that, yeah, it's, so it's basically the Lorentz, electromagnetic Lorentz force in curved space time that's introducing that coupling whereas for this term over here uh that involves the christoffel symbol and hence the mass uh, does appear there um i can't see how electromagnetism would come into that term because the connections are geometric as we know they're the usual geometric connections from you know riemannian geometry and all that good stuff um, so okay. it seems like there's a non, it's like an asymmetrical situation yeah. where, where the, this like special new force in the green box is really an electromagnetic force, but just impacted by the presence of gravity. And we don't seem to have the opposite. Yeah. And, and I had another one real quick. Is it okay to have, take one more minute, Charles? Sure. Yeah, uh, Nathan, in your other result regarding the exclusion in the superconductor, you said you only get exclusion of the gravitomagnetic field when a magnetic when an electromagnetic field is present, right? Yeah. Um, you know, physically, how can that work? Because we we know that you know you can't shield the metric. You know, like it would be inside of a bank vault. You know, the the metric goes everywhere. How is it, you know, does it make sense physically that some finite object can affect a local gravitational field? Does that make any sense, you know, given even like what was in DeWitt's 1953 essay that you can't reflect it, you can't absorb it? What, what, how do we reconcile, you know, those two pictures? That is an excellent question, Lance, and I'm so glad you asked because that was something I thought would be a useful discussion, even briefly, uh, which is that the gravitomagnetic field, as you know, is generated by mass currents. And so we have the option of reversing its direction, unlike the, say, Newtonian gravitational field, which is generated just by the presence of mass. And since mass is always positive, then the gravitomagnetic, the gravitoelectric field always points in the same direction. You can't reverse that. But this guy can be reversed. So my physical explanation that I offered actually in my paper that I submitted for peer review, my physical explanation of what's going on is that when the magnetic field is present, it drives current, as we know. And because it drives current, 
it can flip the direction of the overall current and hence flip the direction of the gravitomagnetic field and introduce a canceling gravitomagnetic field that cancels the external gravitomagnetic field and leads to the vanishing in the superconductor. Okay. Is that somewhat somewhat uh, convincing of how that could happen? Yeah. It's, it's hard to believe, though, that if a whole planet is making the external gravitomagnetic field and then a little ring could counteract that. You oh, know? now remember, the little ring has a magnetic field in it that's driving the current. So it's the same reason yeah. why, you're, you're, why our feeble hand can lift a pencil in opposition to the Earth's gravitational field. It's because our mechanical force is so much stronger than that gravitational mm. force. So it'd be the same thing. It'd be that the magnetic field is so much stronger than the gravitational field that it can reverse the direction of the current and then generate a new countering gravitomagnetic field that cancels the external one that came in. That's the best mm. I think I could probably offer as far as mathematically I saw it came out. And then I felt that I did need to sort of justify um, conceptually why that would be the case. And so that was my my attempt at explaining uh, kind of why, why that happens that way. And I did yeah. that in this paper here in this paragraph, um, trying to explain that, that, that idea. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, any last questions for, or comments for Nathan? Do you explain in your new paper the, um, the issue or the, you know, what about DeWitt's derivation and, you know, how he didn't really expand things out, I think is kind of, maybe he I did, I did, I bullet pointed it out actually here, because what I do in this paper is I start out with DeWitt's results and I show there's actually six issues. Hmm. And so <laughs> the issues that I sort of touched on um, concerning the Hamiltonian, concerning the minimal coupling rule, concerning the requirement that the magnetic field be present as well as the gravitomagnetic field, um, concerning the fact that the gravitomagnetic field is coordinate dependent, and so this is an effect that could be made to vanish altogether. Um, and I didn't get to talk about it in our talk today, but I can also show why the predicted electric current that DeWitt thought should exist in a superconducting ring in the presence of a you know, like rotating mass is also uh -huh. a problem. So it's uh -huh. all there if anybody's interested in further reading. Yeah. Um, and I submitted to Frontiers and as I mentioned, they are peer reviewing it. So if right. that goes through then. That should be a really, that should be a really important paper, I think, <laughs> in my humble opinion. I very much hope that will be true. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, Nathan. Uh, very much appreciated. Thank you too.